Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, we actually are starting a, uh, a new series as we have concluded the book of 1 Corinthians last Sunday. And we, for the next seven weeks, we actually are going to start a series called Disciplines of Grace, uh, Spiritual Disciplines, Disciplines of Grace. And this morning, we're going to look at the longest chapter in the Bible, but only in the first 18 verses. So our scripture reading here in this series of Disciplines of Grace will come from Psalm 119, verses 1 to 18. And so if I could kindly ask everyone to please stand if you're able for the reading of God's word. As we receive the word here this morning, I pray that your hearts would be open <clears throat> and that your minds would be open. Uh, Psalm 119, starting with verse 1, we'll read to verse 18. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. You also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. On, oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of, my, of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. This is a reading of the Bible. Please take your seats. <clears throat> uh, so we're starting a new series, as I said, called Disciplines of Grace. And in this series, we're basically asking one question, and that question is this. How can we have everlasting change in our lives? How can we effect real spiritual gospel change and transformation in our lives? What disciplines can we practice through the grace of Jesus so that we can be conformed to the image of Jesus and have everlasting gospel change? That's what we're trying to ask. How can we really change? And the world today actually will offer essentially two different answers to that question of how you could change your life and find happiness. And one trajectory of the, what the world will tell you is that essentially uh, you have to change your circumstances and your behavior or change your thinking. You know, behavior modification or positive thinking. The other broad trajectory, generally speaking, is going to be some sort of medication. And I'm not saying that actually any of those two ways are wrong. There's some things that we could learn even from a Christian perspective. But at the end of the day, what the Bible offers us in terms of everlasting and real change is not just behavior modification apart from the Bible, nor is it just sort of science and medicine and medication, although that certainly under the grace of God could be something beneficial. But here in Psalm 119, he says, the way to effect real lasting change is going to be through the very word of God. And so we're asking here, what can bring lasting change? What disciplines are there that could bring real spiritual change in your lives? And the first way to effect this change that we'll consider here today is reading your Bible, the very word of God. It is actually not the only discipline of grace, but perhaps the most fundamental discipline of grace, the most foundational it's the very means of spiritual change and transformation, and that's why we're going to consider the longest chapter in the Bible, the longest psalm in the Bible, 119, although we're looking at the first 18 verses. And so if the Bible is really the source and the way to effect lasting change in your lives, lasting spiritual gospel transformation, the most fundamental and pervasive foundational way to change your life, then we should probably consider what actually is the Word of God and how can we read it and what's the significance of it. And so as we look at these verses, I want us to see really three things about the Word of God, three things about His Word, three questions. First, I want to ask, what is it? Secondly, what can it do? And then third, how can we use it? So when you look at the Bible, we're going to ask, what is it? What can it do in our lives and in and through us? And then third, how do we practically begin to read the Bible and use it? So let's take a look at this. Three questions about the Bible, three questions about the Word of God. So first, what is it? What is the nature of the Bible? What are its characteristics? Why is it so beautiful? What does the Bible tell us about itself? 
C.S. Lewis, in his commentary on Psalm, says about 119, and he says, Psalm 119 is not and does not pretend to be a sudden outpouring of the heart, you see. He says it's a pattern. Psalm 119 is a thing done like embroidery, stitch by stitch through long, quiet hours for love of the subject and for the delight in leisurely, disciplined craftsmanship. He says that's Psalm 119. It's not necessarily the most emotional, such as Psalm 23 or 3 or 73. He says, actually, Psalm 119 is a carefully crafted, orchestrated chapter about the Bible, stitch by stitch like embroidery, something that's tedious, disciplined, and takes long hours. That already tells us, by the nature of Psalm 119, what sort of the nature of the Bible is. That's what we want to consider. The most important thing you need to know about what the Bible is is that it is a word But what the Bible tells us is that it's the word of the Lord. It's God actually speaking to us, you see? You know, he's literally speaking, it's living and active, and he's showing us that God breathes this word out for our benefit, and it comes from him. He's speaking to us. It's intricate, precise, and it's detailed, and that's the nature of the word of God. In fact, the Bible, the entire book of Psalms begins with the word of God, as Elder Andy has prayed, that the blessed man is someone whose delight is in the law of the Lord, And on his law, he meditates day and night. The Old Testament scholar uh, Derek Kidner says about chapter 119, he says that it is the full flowering of this delight found in chapter 1 and gives us a personal witness to the many-sided qualities and attributes of of Scripture. In other words, what is he saying? He's saying in Psalm 119, we have many adjectives, synonyms about the nature of the Bible, and he says these are many sides of Scripture that are like a collection of bells that they ring in perfect harmony, displaying the very beauty of God. That's what the Bible is for us. So here's what I want to get into the nitty-gritty about what the nature of the Bible is. There are, in these 18 verses, four characteristics about the Bible that we'll run through quickly. So what is it? What is the Word of God? More specifically, this is what it is. The Word of God is truthful, it's authoritative, it's precise, and it's binding. The Word of God is truthful, it's authoritative, it's precise, and it's binding. I'm going to run through this really quickly. So first, what is the Word of God? It's truthful. There we get this word, unsurprisingly, it says there about the Bible that the Bible is a word, the Word of the Lord. The, the word, word there is four times in four verses in 9, 11, 16, and 17. So when you look at the word study for what does it mean when it says, you know, I delight in the law of the Lord, or he says, I have hidden your word in my heart, the word there it actually implies that it's the most general term referring to any of God's truth in any state or form. You no, know, spoken, commanded, prescribed. The word there means actually something that's actually communicated. So it's spoken there, which means that there's a speaker and there's a communicator. So when you're asking, what is the Bible, you're saying, well, it's the Word. The Word of the Lord means that somebody is trying to communicate to you and speak to you. It just isn't the Word, but actually it's the Word of God. And because it's from God, it means that the Word, this Bible here, is what they say is infallible and inerrant because its origin is from heaven. In the same way that God is actually without errors, and if he speaks his Word, his Word has to be like his nature without errors. So that means implicitly the Word is any truth that in any shape or form that has no errors. And so, friends, if you struggle with this because you're thinking, well, there's contradictions in the Bible, or it doesn't really you know, live up to scientific standards, well, there's a, there's a discussion. You know, maybe we can dialogue about that, but that's maybe for a, a different discussion. But at the end of the day, what we're saying is that the Bible says about itself, it's truthful, it's the Word of God, it's without error, and within all its words and to the extent from Genesis to Revelation, it is actually heavenly and it was infallible. It will never lead you astray. You know, as the, the story I once heard about a seminary professor who's teaching about the doctrine of word, he had a student who was, uh, you know, viciously and somewhat tenaciously just arguing for the fact that the Bible has all kinds of errors. So every lecture, he would raise his hand and say, well, professor, what about the error here? You know, what about this inconsistency here? What about this contradiction here? And he would always bring all these sort of supposed contradictions of the Bible until the professor got so angry and frustrated, he got so fed up that he says to the student, why don't you just take a pair of scissors and cut out all the parts of the Bible that you think are in error so you could figure out what the Bible is for yourself? And basically saying, 
metaphorically, if you cut out all the parts of the Bible you think are in error, the shape of what you're left with will be the very shape of man. You're basically determining for yourself what God has spoken to you. And then that means ultimately that you're going to live in a man-centered, autonomous way. So friends, the first thing we have to recognize, as hard as it may be, is that the Bible says about itself that it's a truthful word. It's a very word of God. And then secondly, because it's the word of God, what we'll notice here is that the word, the Bible, is authoritative. It has authority. It tells you and has the right to tell you how to live your life. Well, where do we get this? Well, two synonyms for the Bible. There is law in verses 1 to 18, and there's also commandments in verses 4, 6, and 10. Law and commandments. So commandments basically says this is straight authority. Not just the power to convince, but I have the right to tell you to what to do. The law here tells you this is the standard of absolute morality and righteousness. The law there basically says, I demand your obedience. It is actually the very word of God that is Lord of your life. Now, friends, I want to say this, because in our culture here today, the authority of the Bible is probably the hardest thing for all of us to kind of soak in. Authority actually is a bad word here today. You know, generations ago, authority was something that was a little bit received differently, expressed and appreciated a little bit differently, that authority structures about, about their, out there in society is something that we have to follow. But in this day and age, actually, authority is something that is very distasteful. None of us like to be told what to do, how to use our money, what our marriages should be like, what jobs, how should we talk. We don't actually like authority. We actually think today, if you talk to actually people who are non-Christians, they'll say, actually, the Bible and Christian, you're so like binding. You know, it feels like a straitjacket that you're so re regressive and re oppressive that you limit, you know, human capacity and autonomy and full human freedom. So in this day and age, authority is the hardest thing actually to swallow for people. But this is what I want to say. If we had more time, we could go into more depth about this. But this idea to say that without authority, the Bible leads to human flourishing and freedom actually is a very gross misunderstanding because even in nature, and you look out in life, the way to have full freedom and to flourish well is actually not the absence of authority, but the presence of authority. You know, to reach your full capacity and your potential is not actually the absence of restrictions, but the presence of the right restrictions, the right authority of your life. That's what we have to understand. Freedom comes when we live in the way that actually we were designed. So just very simply, you know, the right restrictions have to be in place. So for example, if you take a fish out of water, then it will never actually swim and thrive and reach its full capacity. It wasn't made to actually be in the air or on land. The fish thrives and reaches its full capacity under the restrictions and authority and the placement of water. The same way if you put a bird in water, the bird will never fully be a bird. It wasn't designed to swim. It was designed to fly, to soar in the air. So it has to have the right restrictions over your life. So if you put the bird in the air, the right restrictions, the right environment, the right authority, then it could fully fly and reach its full capacity. Another way, think about it this way. A train can only be a train to fully thrive as a locomotive under the right restrictions and authority. You know, it's not meant to go on a highway. It's not to go through domestic travel in the neighborhood. You need the tracks to restrict the pathway of the train, but when you have the right restrictions and authority, then what happens? The train becomes fully a train. It becomes fully a locomotive. It thrives. It fully flourishes, and it's on the pathway to freedom. See, freedom in all of life is not the absence of restrictions, but the presence of the right ones. And so if we are created and designed for a specific purpose, to be actually the image of God, that means for humans and human flourishing and freedom, it's not the absence of restrictions, but the presence of the right ones. So what is the presence of our right restrictions? The authority of the Bible. See, the tracks of the train for our lives is going to be the law and on the gospel. So our lives run on the law and gospel in this one way to show the holiness of God, but also the grace and the love of God. Our lives run on the pathway to freedom on the law and gospel. That is revealed to us in Psalm 119 in the Bible. So if you're thinking, well, the Bible is authoritative. It says it's a law, commandments. I don't really like that. You'll never reach full happiness and true, full flourishing and freedom in your life unless you recognize the Bible is actually the right restrictions and authority over your lives. That's what the Bible tells us. And also, not only is it simply truthful and authoritative, but we see here that it's also precise. And we get this from the word precepts, verses 4 and 15. That word is drawn from an officer, manager, overseer, 
that word points to a particular instruction or someone who cares about details. On the one hand, it sounds kind of distasteful because it sounds someone is nitpicking and meddling in our life. But actually, what that word tries to convey is this idea, friends, if you understand it, is that God has a detailed concern over your life. He cares about the everyday matters of what you're going through for the particulars of your thoughts and experiences. Think about it, friends. This is really reassuring. The transcendent, omnipotent God who created the universe, this is what it says. He has precepts for you. He's precise about your life, not because he's an overparenting God, but because he has lavishing love over the details of every particular detail of your life, every hair of your head, every traffic jam that you go through, every concern. He has a particular care for your life, and he wants to say, this is what I want you to do about it. God loves and cares about the details of your life. And last but not least, the Word of God is binding. It's forceful. It, has, it binds our conscience. But where do we get this? In the word statutes, verse 5, 8, 12, and 16. Statutes, just let's do a word study here. Statutes basically has a binding force saying that Scripture and the Word of God has a permanence in your life because the word statutes comes from the same word as status and statue. No, they come from the root word saying that something stands up, it's erect. You know, if you want something that's binding, forceful, everlasting, you know, go to a statue because they're heavy. They last forever. The best statue that I could think of is actually one uh, built in Paris, I think, in France, and transported to New York City, the Statue of Liberty. It's a symbol of freedom. Immigrants that take the boat back in the generations ago see the statue. It symbolizes, expresses something, and it's still there. It's impressive. It has an impression. It lasts forever. That idea is captured in the word statutes. That these are commands, these are guidelines, these are statutes in the Bible. The Bible are statutes, but it's binding and it's forceful, it's heavy. It weighs on your life. That's the word of God. It's truthful, it's authoritative, it's precise, and it's binding. And last, before we move on to the second point, I have to say this about the nature of the Bible. The Bible, first and foremost, although we say it's law and commandments, is not first and foremost when you take this Bible and you look to this, Say, it's not an instruction manual for your life. This is not a cookbook to make your life happy. See, most other Bibles, most other religious books are instruction. They're manuals for laws and instruction. But the Bible, first and foremost, is not a book of instruction because then it would make it about yourself. How can I do this? How can I think about this? How can I live like this? The Bible, first and foremost, is not instruction, but it's a story. It's a message. It's not telling you first what to do, but it's first telling you the love of God and Jesus for you. That's what we have to understand. All other religions, all other religious books are primarily books of instruction sort of peppered with stories to illustrate the instructions. The Bible is completely and fundamentally different because it's not a book about instructions. It's actually first and foremost a a book of a story, a message sprinkled with instructions to say that God actually loves people and he saves people in his son. So we have to see this very differently because that basically means that Christianity is very different. It's not first about what you do to go to heaven, but it's actually first about what Jesus has done for you to give you heaven, and then you live out of that reality. The Bible is not a standard, actually, that you have to live up to as much, actually, is that in Jesus is the standard that you live out of. The law of God is not a set of heavy instructions that weighs burdensome over your shoulder that you feel guilty and demoralized. The Bible in Jesus Christ is actually the law of God in which you walk in the pathway of freedom in Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible is for you. It's first a story sprinkled with instructions. It's not instructions sprinkled with stories because that's the message of grace and truth in the gospel of Jesus. And so this leads us to our second point. What does this Bible promise to do in you? What does the Bible say that it could do for you? Well, let's take a look at this. There are some big promises made here. Uh, The Word will give you basically two things, not only two things, but in 18 verses, it will give you at least these two things. If you practice, if you apply, if you delve and you immerse yourself and saturate your soul in the Bible, it promises these two things. You ready for this? Happiness and holiness. Happiness and holiness. Well, let's take a look at this. First, happiness. You're thinking, that's a big statement. I thought family, marriage, all that will bring me happiness, money, success, career. Certainly it can. But here we're talking about everlasting happiness. So if you're 
frustrated, if you're bitter, if you're broken, the answer fundamentally, not only that, but fundamentally is turn to the Word of God. Now, you're thinking that's a big statement, that's a big promise, but it's probably overstating the case. Let me show you, try to actually at least look at what the Bible says. It's very clear. Happiness. We see this in verses 1 and 2. You don't see the word happiness. You see a better word than happiness. It begins each verse, 1 and 2, and it said, blessed, blessed. That word literally means happy. So it says in verse 1 and 2, happy are those whose way is blameless. Happy are those who keep his testimonies. The biblical word there for happy is blessed, and it means at least happiness, but it's so much deeper and richer and more profound. It means more than happiness. It at least means happiness, but means more than that. It's not talking about just being happy because you get to watch your favorite sports game or you get to watch your favorite play. It's talking about an everlasting, internal sense of peace, a radiant joy in life, an internal stability and approval, a satisfaction in your life that can never be taken away. That's the happiness. That's what blessed means. Not just happiness, but more than that, a deep, profound joy, a radiant inner light in which that you have a satisfaction and steadfastness in your life that can never be taken away. Well, let me try to explain what this may look like, this happiness. The uh, New York Times opinion writer David Brooks says this about this sort of characterization of blessedness. He doesn't use that word, but I think what he's talking about captures the essence of what I'm talking about, and he says this. About once a month, I run across a person who radiates inner light. These people can be in any walk of life. They seem deeply good. They listen well. They make you feel funny and valued. You often catch them looking after other people. As they do so, their laugh is musical, and their manner is infused with gratitude. They're not thinking about what wonderful work they are doing. They're not thinking about themselves at all. In fact, when I meet such a person, it brightens my whole day. And he says this, I confess I often have a sadder thought. It occurs to me that I've achieved a decent level of career success, but I have not achieved that. I have not achieved that generosity of spirit, that depth of character. So for David Brooks and his particular journalistic endeavors, he's not actually, he's successful, but he says, I have not reached that level of radiant joy. You know why? Because that blessedness cannot come through career, success, family. Ultimately, it comes through your relationship in the Word of God. This deep, profound, radiant light that when you smile, it sings a musical tone. D.A. Carson says this about blessedness. Blessedness also means fundamentally that you're approved, loved, and accepted. See, that has huge counseling implications because our lives, in some ways, are all about just seeking approval. Approval of our spouses, each other, pastors, leaders, through money, approval through your accomplishments for yourself. You need to be approved by someone, accepted, validated, to say you are good and you're worthy. Our lives are really about scrambling to get approval. But what the Bible says about blessedness, it says that that approval has already been given to you in Jesus, that God approves of you. He loves you. He's accepted you. He gives you this inner radiant joy that transcends all of your circumstances. So no matter what life throws at you up and down, you have this radiant buoyancy, this spiritual vitality that can withstand and withhold and endure both the ups and downs of your lives. That's what the Word promises you. So how does the Word give you this? Through living out the Bible, friends. Look at verse 1 and 2. It says, blessed are those who what? In verse 1. Blessed are those who walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 2, blessed are those who do what? Who walk in his ways. Now, cut out all the middle in there. You know, I'm just kind of going to the beginning the end of the verses. Blessed are those who walk. That's what 1 and 2 says. Walk in the law of the Lord. Walk in his ways. Walk is a metaphor for the Christian life. It's actually your style, your character, your lifestyle. Go from point A to point B. How are you walking? Some of you are walking along idolatry. Some of you are walking along the wicked. Some of you are walking along your own personal aspirations apart from God. You will never receive blessedness that way. Very clear. One and two, how do you get this happiness, this David Brooks inner radiant light that he's never achieved himself? It says there, one and two, walk in the law of the Lord, walk in his ways. Now, before some of you reform folks who are very theologically astute saying, that sounds moralistic, that sounds legalistic, well, this is what he says. Blessed are the moral, and blessed are the obedient. So if you're moral and you're obedient in Jesus, you get it, but it's not a legalistic, manufactured way of getting happiness because verse 2 says, who seek him with all their heart. In other words, he is the God who speaks to us 
And our blessedness is bound up with our attitude to what God says. Or as I said it before, or I've heard it said, you go to the word of the Lord to find the Lord of the word. Does that make sense? So it's not a legalistic, manufactured way, my obedience will give me happiness. No, this obedience, this blessedness, this morality, this happiness, this radiant inner light actually comes through your personal relationship with God in Jesus Christ because you turn to the word of the Lord to find the Lord of the word. Blessedness is always characterized in the Bible as a relationship. Those who belong to God and are part of his kingdom, blessed. Those who are united to Jesus in his death and resurrection. Blessedness in the Bible always is talking about a particular relationship. So blessed people are those who are accepted, approved, or are in a vital relationship with Jesus Christ and God. And the second thing that the Bible promises to do in you is not just happiness, but also holiness. Look at this with me. Verse 9, classic, it says, how can a young man keep his way pure? The answer is very plain, friends. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. By guarding it. In other words, he says this, the path you walk in life is guarded, is watched over by the word of God. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Or verse 11 here, it says this, and we'll spend some time a little bit on verse 11. This is what he says. I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. It's very practical. How, do you, how does the Bible promise holiness? How does it make you pure? If you want to stop sinning, if you want to live a godly life, many of you are thinking, how do I do this? Let me go on a mission trip. You know, maybe I've got to get an accountability partner. You know, maybe I've got to get a visitation by the pastor or the elder. All of that certainly is true. Here, King David is getting attacked. He's sinful. Remember, King David committed adultery, killed Bathsheba's husband, and this is what maybe he's saying. They don't know if King David wrote 119. How do you stop sinning? Verse 11, I have stored up your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. That's a purpose clause. That I might not sin against you. Store up the word so that I don't sin. The way not to sin is to store up the word of God. Store there means it's also translated hidden. That means that the Bible, friends, is internalized and memorized. It becomes part of you, and it becomes your true north in life. It directs what you do. It directs all your affections and your thoughts. We have a message that says that Jesus loves us, and it directs and guides and saturates everything that we do and think. That's what it says. Friends, it's very practical here. Are you sinning in your life? Well, the answer, if you don't know, is yes, you are, because I sin in my life. And if you want happiness, if you want holiness, verse 11 says the way to fight your sin fundamentally, practically, is store up the word in your heart. So friends, when was the last time you sat down and you just read your Bible? You talked to Jesus through the Bible? You read the Bible. When was the last time you've done this? Because if you never talked to Jesus, if you never read the Bible, then don't be surprised that you're sinning all the time. It doesn't say just read it. Actually, it's deeper. It says store up. It means you internalize the Bible. You memorize it. It becomes part of you. When you store up, you hide the word of the Bible in your heart. You internalize it so that it actually becomes part of your nature and who you are. Your true north directing all that you do. That's the message of the Bible for you. It's the word of God that tells you this is how you ought to live. Friends, what is your true north in this life? Let's just talk about this for a second. What is the word that guides everything in your lives? Maybe it's the word of personal success and glory. Maybe it's the word of marriage that you desire to be in a relationship or in a healthier marriage. Maybe it's the word of money. You're saying money actually would be the true north of my life. Maybe it's good grades in college. That's my true north. Or is it what the Bible's trying to tell us and say, actually, it's the word incarnate. Jesus Christ, according to John 1, which says the word became flesh so that when it says you store up the Bible, I've hidden the Bible in my heart. I treasured is also what that word means. It's saying in your heart and lives, you look and you store up the word incarnate, Jesus Christ, in your life. You fellowship with Jesus. You pray to him. You talk to him. You hear him. You receive him. You cultivate that relationship. There's no way to go around sin apart from verse 11. I have stored up your word in my heart. We simply have to read our Bibles. you got to look to the Bible. 
Yes, you could hear the word through sermons. You could hear through the word through Bible study. You could turn on Christian radio, and all that certainly is, tr- is true and is the case. But he says at the end of the day, one of the things you have to do is read your Bible. You spend time personally engrossing and immersing yourself in the Bible. And this leads us to our last practical point. If that's the case, how do you do that? How do you use the Bible? We're going to get this from all verse 18. <clears throat> how do we use the Bible? Verse 18 says, Open my eyes. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. This is a prayer, a prayer of illumination. There's three things that we want to consider quickly here about how to read the Bible. First, what we have to recognize is this. There are wonderful things in the law. Look at verse 18. That I may behold wonderful things out of your law. It doesn't say maybe there are wonderful things. There are wonderful things in the Bible. Do you ever realize that when you read the Bible... It's confusing, it's boring, you get through it, you check, box, you check the box off. Why is it that when you read the Bible, you don't have experiences like the great theologian Jonathan Edwards, where he delves into the Bible and he's so like immersed and he's so moving aback, taken aback. Why is that? Well, this is what we're going to try to say. The first thing we recognize is that it's not because there are no wonderful things in the Bible, and then for other people there are. Jonathan Edwards gets so moved by the Bible because everywhere and everywhere, anywhere, there are wonderful things in the law. That word law there just means teaching. It could mean the Ten Commandments, the first five books of the Bible, or the entire Bible. There are wonderful things in the law, friends. When you read here, you have to understand that there are wonderful things in here. The reason that you don't see it, which we'll get to, is because you're not digging deep enough You're not spending enough time. As John Piper has once said, when you read the Bible, it's like raking, but it's also digging. Sometimes you'll read 10 chapters quickly. That's like raking, which is good, but all you get from raking are leaves. Sometimes you got to sit for 30 minutes on one verse, and you look at that verse, and you just pray, God, help me to see wonderful things in this law, and that's like digging. And what happens when you dig? Sometimes you find a diamond. So when you read the Bible, there are wonderful things of the law But the reason we don't see this or the reason we can't perceive it is because maybe we're not digging deep enough. This this is the second thing we have to see. The way to see these wonderful things, it comes in the first part of the verse 18. We need God to open our eyes. You see? We can't see wonderful things of our hearts by faith without the Spirit's work in opening our eyes. As one pastor said, the Spirit of God and the Word of God always go together. In other words, the mind-informing work of the Bible always comes with the heart-opening work of the Spirit. He says here, there are wonderful things in the law. The only way that the psalmist can see this, and you can see this, is if God opens your eyes. When's the last time that you look at this passage, go to Leviticus, no idea what it's saying, God, open my eyes to help me see the wonderful things of your law. The Word of God can speak to you at any moment, friends. That's how the Bible works. This is a silly example. I just, how the, God, how the Bible spoke to me once. Uh, God works in different ways. Uh, about six years ago, a group of guys at this church uh, for my birthday bought me a, a bowling ball for my birthday. And, you know, it was a very thoughtful and generous gift. They bought me a bowling ball. We were bowling a lot six years ago over at Anaheim 300, and so they, oh, Pastor Will loves bowling, so let's get him a bowling ball for his uh, birthday. So I was really thankful. It was very gracious and thoughtful. And so it was a nice bowling ball. It was blue. It looked like a tropical storm. That was actually the name of the bowling ball, tropical storm. See a little, like, a storm brewing on the design of the ball, and you get it customized because you get it measured with your fingers. So I go to the bowling alley, get it measured with my, potential, my, my particular grip, circumference of my thumb, and also because it's customized, you actually get a, uh, an inscription. So you can write your name, your saying, your motto of your life. And so, I, okay, it's a tropical storm, so I'm going to put a Bible verse on my inscription. So I went and I researched, I googled, and said, okay, I'm going to put Job 37.5. That'll be the inscription. 37.5 in Job says, God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot com- comprehend. So I wanted to put that on the bowling ball so that it could be the motto of my tropical storm ball. So I went there, I accidentally gave him the wrong verse. Instead of, instead of Job 37.5, I said, can you please put on Job 
And so I went back and I was like, wait, this is the wrong verse, 35.7. So I look up 35.7. What does that say? If you are righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? So I'm thinking to myself, God works in wonderful ways. <laughs> there is a certain way that God at certain moments can open your eyes. In fact, I thought the verse that I needed could be something funny. God thunders wondrously with his voice. But in some ways, I find that Job 35.7 may be a daily reminder in my lives. If you are righteous, what do you give to him? What, or what does he receive from your hand? Isn't that a remarkable verse? For those of you like me who are self-righteous and prideful, think that you deserve, are entitled, and accomplished, if you are righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? When you look at the Bible and how to use it, we acknowledge there are wonderful things in his law, we have to open our eyes to see this. The last thing that the Bible tells us in this verse about how to read the Bible, it says there, right there, that I may behold, behold, that you desire and that you look upon, that you soak in and you, you, you gaze at the Bible. You know, as one pastor I read said it this way when he was in high school and he went to Bible camp, uh, the teacher there says, okay, take a passage of the Bible and I want you to spend uh, 30 minutes, force yourself to read this passage over and over again for 30 minutes and write down everything that you see that's insightful. So every student went back for the first five minutes, they wrote initial things and said, okay, there's, that's all I can see, there's nothing there. Then they read it again, after 10 minutes, they wrote a little bit more. After 15, after 20, every time they went back after 30 minutes, every time they found something new because they behold, they beheld something in the Bible. So when all the students came back, the teacher was saying, let's share some of the things that we thought were the most profound. And they shared and they raised their hands and shared all the things they saw in the Bible that are the most profound. And the vast majority of what these students actually found that was the most profound and insightful and spoke most deeply to their hearts were those insights that they found at the 25-minute mark. Behold, look. Practically, you have to read the Bible for breath and depth. And this is what we're trying to get at, friends. You come to the Bible to behold wonderful things in His law because a godly li lot, life is lived out with an astonished heart, an astonished, a heart that is astonished by grace. See, remember when I said that the Bible is not an instruction book, but it's a story? When you come to the Bible, you're not looking just for information or actually how to do something. You come to the Bible because it's living and active, and that God is speaking to you. You want to talk to God. You want to hear Him. He's speaking to you. So you come to the Bible, not actually to learn something, but to really be taken aback by someone. See, it helps us to, let me say this, it helps to acknowledge that the vast majority of our lives are lived spontaneously, friends. 99% of your daily decisions are about something that happens naturally and spontaneously. 99% of your decisions happen without any immediate reflection. So when you come to the Bible, you come to the Bible not first to know what to do, but to meet someone so you can be transformed. The Bible first doesn't tell you what to do. It gives you a message to transform you into a person you ought to be. 99% of all your daily decisions happen spontaneously, naturally, because it comes out of the character of who you are. Either you are someone who loves Jesus and been transformed by the gospel, or you're not. And the Bible, when we come, is not first just for theology and knowledge, but it's a relationship to actually understand who Jesus is for myself, so that you come before God in all his majesty, in all his glory, in all his redemptive works that culminate on the person of Jesus, and you don't walk away and say, this is now how, now how I know how to watch TV, but you walk away and say, what a beautiful, wonderful Savior that your heart is so astonished and moved by this reality. The most wonderful thing to see in this Bible is a wonderful person who has fulfilled the law for us. When it says in 118, open my eyes to behold wonderful things of your law, the most wonderful thing to see is not the law itself, but the person to whom the law pushes us to see face to face Jesus Christ. Open my eyes to behold 
Jesus who fulfilled the law. Open my eyes to see wonderful things. Doesn't that sound like a song? Open my eyes, eyes to behold wonderful things. Wonderful, wondrous. It's a famous song. Do you know it? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face as the things of the earth go strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. 118 is telling us to look directly into the person who has fulfilled the law for you, who is the very word of God, who has revealed God to us and has covered your sin in himself so that by faith we are united to him so that we can see face to face in full love, beauty, and glory his wonderful face for us. Friends, I pray that you would spend time reading the Bible and talking and meeting with Jesus. These spiritual disciplines are disciplines. As one person said, without discipline, you're left with disaster. You have to read the Bible. We'll do our part to preach the gospel. We'll do our part to provide through discipleship, community groups, just word of God. But that will never replace your personal application of reading the Bible. Christian radio will not replace the Bible. Listening to the MP3 of Tim Keller and John Piper Matt Chandler, Alistair Begg will not replace the Bible. Nothing will replace the direct conversation of Jesus speaking into your lives as you look to Jesus face to face. Let us turn to Christ right now in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you have given us your word that is living and active, that is truthful, that is authoritative, that is precise that is rich and glorious in all its ways. I pray for each and every one of us that we would hide your word in our hearts so that we may not sin against you. I pray for each and every one of us that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things in our law so that we may truly cherish and see the glory and the grace of Jesus Christ for us. So Lord, we thank you so much for this time. We love you. We pray that we may persevere for the sake of your kingdom so that we may live on the tracks and the pathway of your righteousness that will bring full flourishing and freedom for us. We thank you and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. In response to the reading and preaching of God's word, um, can we all rise at this time and respond with a song of thanksgiving?